All right, uh, we're beginning week four. Things are moving along at a good clip. Um, we wrapped up laws of nature last week. Um, so this week we're gonna talk about the scientific realism, anti-realism debate. Um, and I think to do that well, I think good idea is to step back in time for a moment and talk about logical empiricism. Uh, this was a movement in sort of the early 20th century, and it's gonna echo throughout what we talk to talk about in the more contemporary debate. And I think you'll understand the contemporary debate uh, more completely if we spend a little time talking about how it, uh, this historical sort of antecedent. Um, so this corresponds to the chapter from the Staley textbook. So it should be a relatively straightforward read. That's not one of those um, readings that are sort of taken from the, you know, the actual the primary sources that are can sometimes be more more difficult to log through so i encourage you to read that chapter as well and let's get into it so as i said to set up the debate on scientific realism i think it's helpful to go back in history a little bit um, over here on our right is a fellow named rudolf carnap um, and he is a, an important figure in this uh in logical empiricism he started out in Vienna, was a member of what was called the Vienna Circle, which was a group of philosophers and scientists that um, uh, developed this view of philosophy of science called logical empiricism. He ended up in the US, right, because this was before World War II. Um, things got very difficult, particularly if you were Jewish, and um, a lot of people moved to the US, and he ended up at UCLA. Um, interesting figure and good writer. I didn't include any of his articles in the, um, uh, in the readings. There are, can be a little dry, but um, but interesting stuff. So as I said, this movement was in Vienna, largely in Europe, early 20th century. It's sometimes called logical positivism, same thing. And they sort of set up the stage, I think, for the contemporary realism debate. Uh, the problems they were concerned with, I think, are slightly different than the ones we'll be discussing in the next couple lectures, um, where we talk about what's called the no miracles argument, and then what's called the pessimistic meta-induction. Um, those, you will, as you will soon see, are mostly concerned about uh, theory change, right? There are old scientific theories, and it turns out they're wrong, and then we get better ones. And um, the contemporary debate is very concerned about what does that mean, right? Um, if our old ones were wrong, how do we know that we have, that our new theories are, are right? Are those gonna eventually be proven wrong, and then we have to move on to a new theory? Um, that'll sort of be the crux of the debate we'll talk about. Um, these logical positivists at the time were a little more concerned with separating science from metaphysics, which was really kind of just over the last century or two starting to happen, right? So back, everything used to be philosophy, right? I think I mentioned this in the lecture one. Um, so physics, biology, in the days of Aristotle, it was all kinds of philosophy and things sort of as we get answers to things, they tend to sort of branch off and become their own thing. Um, so we did have still, I think at this time, there was a lot of mingling uh, when we we're asking about sort of the basic constitution of the universe, right? What is what is there out there? What this this is called ontology when we talk about these sort of things, what, what exists. Um, at the time, I think there was still a lot of people doing metaphysics that thought they were really getting answers. And then there were starting to be people doing science that thought, look, this is, better way to go about things. And so these logical positivists did not want to be associated with metaphysics. So here's like a, here's a little example of um, what the logical positivists didn't like about the metaphysics at the time. So um, here we have Carnap up there and down underneath him we have Heidegger, who was a German philosopher. Um, and Hegel is another philosopher that was still popular at the time. Um, and their philosophy, whether you think it's good or bad, it was certainly very wordy, very abstract, um, and it used what we call a priori methodology, which means just sort of by thinking about concepts, um, they thought that you could get to the truth of what there is, of what exists. Um, whereas someone like Carnap was much more like Hume, uh, interested in observation, right? Or sent the senses as, as our road to the truth about what there is. Now, that's not entirely fair to Heidegger. I, I have some sympathy for Heidegger. 
Um, although in his political life, he was a very bad man. He was a, a Nazi. But his uh, philosophy, in some ways, he is sort of interested in um, what we call phenomenology. So is paying attention to our experience and experience. But um, as the debate is usually framed, right, we have sort of current up on one side, thinks evidence from the senses is sort of where we get our road to truth. And we have these other metaphysicians who are just making stuff up in their heads. Um, so how do we distinguish science from metaphysics? Um, so current and logical positivists want to frame it in terms of truth, right? And this is true statements, meaningful statements, right? Semantics. And what does it mean for a statement to be true or false, or even the sort of statement that could be true or false? And it's good to hook into this now because it will be coming up later in later readings. Um, so for the logical positivists, they want to say that any statement that doesn't in some way hook up with observation that can be confirmed by observation, um, it's going to be meaningless unless right, there's some way to observe and determine whether it's true or false. Um, and they think that's going to, and, and, and at least in principle, right? So maybe something like, um, so the statement, there is a cow on the dark side of the moon, right? Um, that seems very weird, and it doesn't seem like at the moment we could observe and determine whether that's true or false. But in principle, it is. Um, you could determine whether it is true or false. We travel to the moon, look for a cow. Um, so the kinds of right sentences, statements that the uh, Carnap and logical positives are worried about are not so much statements that would be very hard to verify, right, or confirm by observation, but sentences that there's just no conceivable way that you could ever observe anything that would determine whether it was true or false. Um, and the example taken from Heidegger is in it, there is a sentence, and it's in the context of you know a larger theory, but at one point he says, the nothing nothings, right? And this is sort of held up uh, for ridicule a bit by the logical positivists saying, what could that possibly mean? What possible observation could ever determine whether that statement is true or false? And they want to say, in fact, that statement is not even the kind of thing that could be true or false. It's literally meaningless. Now, this is sort of an, if you think about it, a pretty extreme um, account of meaning, right? So anything that doesn't, uh, can't be observed would be meaningless. Well, that can't be t completely true, right? Uh, for example, take analytic claims, right? So if I want to say all bachelors are unmarried, uh, the way I determine whether that's true is not by going out and observing bachelors and seeing if they, you know, have marriage certificates or something. Um, some sentences are true in virtue of the meanings of the words, right? Um, all bachelors are unmarried is true is because that's what bachelor, the word bachelor means. Um, so that's fine, right? There will be sentences like that that uh, don't drive their meaning from observation or the possibility of observation. Um, so they want to sort of distinguish those sorts of claims, analytic truths from empirical truths, right? So the analytic ones, true in virtue of meaning, empirical truths, true in virtue of if they can right, be observed, um, or if something in the world can be observed that would make them true. So we end up with something called the, the verifiability criterion of meaning, right? and this is associated with the logic of positives. It says any meaningful non-analytic statement um, must be verifiable by observation. And sometimes they even went further, and they claimed that the meaning of a statement just is its method of verification. But either way, um, they are trying to make this clean distinction between the analytic and empirical. Um, but we still have a problem, right? So even within empirical statements, or statements that should, you would think, count as empirical statements, uh, statements from our, our best scientific theories, they still, it's not clear how you could ever verify them by observation, right? So um, obviously, when we say the nothing nothings, that's pretty clearly, there's nothing we could observe that would uh, make that true. But it's actually even tricky to say what you would observe that would prove that electrons have negative charge, right? We don't observe electrons. We don't observe charges, right? Um, so how are the logical positives going to account for that part? Because um, they do want to save those sorts of statements, right? They do want to believe in electrons um, or at least believe that the 
theories that invoke electrons um, are good and, and are better than metaphysics, right? So this was the strategy of the logical positivists. They said statements about electrons can be translated into statements about really observable things. So it's true, I don't see electrons, right? But I can, with the help of a few instruments, see a trail in a cloud chamber. So in this picture here is exactly that, right? See that little curve? Um, that is the path of an electron through a cloud chamber. And notice it's veering in a particular direction. And uh, if you have sort of magnetically charged uh, objects on either side, then the direction that it curves will indicate its charge, right? So there is a sense in which we can, there is something we can observe, right? And if we want to say, as the logical positives do that, when I say an electron has negative charge, what I really mean to say is, right, that's sort of shorthand for, um, I will observe a certain trajectory in a cloud chamber, right? Um, under certain circumstances, that's all observable. Right, so that's fine. And so, according to the logical positivists, all this talk about electrons is actually um, sort of shorthand for talk about tracks in cloud chamber. Um, so that works, they think, right? Um, that allows us to talk about electrons and 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 mean something by it, as long as you know that implicitly you really mean to be talking about sort of the observable consequences. Um, but it definitely rules out the nothing nothings. Of scientific theories that talk about electrons are meaningful, they just need a little translation. Okay, so let's um, now give a little bit more formal account of, of the logical empiricist account. So they say, here's what we do. First, we divide all of our terminology in our, in our theories into uh, three types. So you have the logical vocabulary, which roughly is those sort of analytic statements that I was talking about, the ones that are true in virtue of meaning, um, also, uh, things that are sort of stipulated and defined, like um, mathematical uh, components or the logical things like and or not, things like that. So that's one category. Um, then you have the observational vocabulary. So that's things like cloud chamber, right, direction of the curve, things that can actually be observed. And then you have the theoretical vocabulary, and that will be things like electron, right, uh, and things like chart, right, stuff that can't be directly observed. So the truth value of statements in the observational vocabulary are just determined by observation. So to the left of three on a dial turns pink. I notice over here on the right, we have some litmus paper, right? I can definitely observe where the litmus paper turns pink. Um, what I can't observe is acidity. Um, so the truth value of the statements in the theoretical vocabulary, things like acidity, gravitational fields, electrons, um, those can't be determined by observation directly. That's the other set of statements. Um, so in order to make theoretical statements meaningful, you need some correspondence rules, right, that link them up with terms in the observational vocabulary. So um, we want to say whenever I say is acidic, something is acidic, right, in my theory, um, I can always translate that into turns litmus paper red. So that was the account, but there's going to be problems for it. Um, so one problem is um, it's just strictly speaking false to say that every time I say the word acidic, all I mean by that is turns the litmus paper red. There's a lot more things I mean by acidity. Acidity um, determines all kinds of ways that a substance will behave and interact with other sentence. When I say something is acidic, I mean it will dissolve grease, right? I mean it could burn my skin, all kinds of things like that many more things than just changing colors of litmus paper. Um, and look, maybe you could do a more complicated correspondence rule, right? You could say, okay, when I say acidic, I mean turns litmus paper red and, right, dissolves grease and such and such. Uh, so you have like sort of a long disjunction or conjunction of things. Um, it might in fact need to be infinite, right? Which could be problematic, um, but there's even worse problems than this. Uh, so correspondence rules are conditionals. Um, and we talked about this with laws, right? It's just kind of a rule of the of the um, logic of conditionals, right? That if the part on the left, the antecedent, uh, is false, 
then the conditional will always turn out true. And you saw this when laws, we, there was a problem that um, the conditional, for everything in the world, if it's a centaur, then it's good at philosophy, right? Um, if there's no such thing as centaurs, and so the antecedent is false, then you end up, right, with the situation where that conditional is actually true, right? Um, and I hope that makes sense by now. We've discussed it enough, right? Um, and if you've taken logic at all, that totally makes sense. If you haven't, just believe me, that's just how conditionals work. And we, you may have noticed we employ a lot of conditionals in our uh, philosophies of science. Okay, so we got this problem, right? Anytime um, you have a false antecedent, you're gonna get a true conditional. So that means that anytime you don't apply something to litmus paper, it's gonna turn out to be acidic, right? Because again, the conditional here is for everything whatsoever, if it's acidic, Sorry, if it's if it turns litmus paper red, then it is acidic, right? So um, that means in any situation where something doesn't turn litmus paper red, it's going to turn out acidic. Um, so that means my dog, the milk in the fridge, right? This computer, things that aren't acidic, um, anything will make that conditional true. So that's not a huge problem. So and that's my dog there, right? Not a huge problem. I can I can change sort of the um, the logical structure of my rules, right? So here's a way around it. I just say, okay, if the sample is applied to litmus paper, then it is acidic, if and only if the paper turns red. That'll be a more complicated logical statement. It won't have that tricky little logical problem. You don't need to get into it. Why? Although if you think logic is interesting and you want to get into it, um, we can talk about it in discussion. So that doesn't give us our problem of like anything is turns out to be acidic, right? Um, but it's not exactly, if you look at that, it doesn't really sound like a definition of acidity, right? Um, and so it doesn't seem like it does the job that it's supposed to do of translating uh, theoretical terms definitionally into observational terms. And there's more problems, right? So, um, so laws do have to be universal generalizations of some sort. And uh, a universal generalization, as we have seen, can never be verified by observation, right? You can't, there's the claim about everything in the world, and you just can't observe everything in the universe, especially everything that will ever exist in the future in the universe, right? Um, so if I want to make a general claim, my scientific law, as it turns out, by this verifiability condition, right, of meaning, um, they're never verifiable, right? I can never observe, for example, all the ravens. If I want to claim all ravens are black, right? If that's supposed to be a, a law of nature, which in fact it isn't, right? Here's a white raven. But um, uh, it ends up being actually totally meaningless just because I can't actually observe every raven that will ever occur. Right? Um, so that means we kind of have to, you'd have to weaken the verification condition to something like corroboration, right? If I observe a certain number of the things, then we'll, we'll go ahead and say that the universal that the law is sort of meaningful um so they really have to right off the bat there's all kinds of sort of adjustments they have to start making um criterion of meaningfulness and so the last couple slides here that's basically it right that's the logical positivist view we're not going to get too much into it unless you think that's interesting for a paper and then um, there's a lot more to be said on that view um, but it's just sort of background for a lot of the stuff we're going to talk about later. Um, and one more thing. So you could characterize this logical empiricist account as a syntactic view of theories. And we've seen similar things in our accounts of explanation, I think, with the deductive nomological account, right? So uh, they tend to talk about scientific theories as sets of sentences, right? And then we have these sort of deductive relations among sentences or these translation relations among sentences. Um, and then some, and we encountered it uh, with the Scriven uh, objections to the DN theory. And I, I noticed some people were a little, I saw in the discussion, a couple people were a little confused by it, right? He cr critiques it by saying, um, we don't wanna get too hung up on relations between sentences, right? Because what we're trying to do is explain things in the world and the things in the world aren't sentences, right? So this logical positivist view sees a scientific theory, right, as something that describes the world, right? Um, 
but what is the thing in the world, right? We're trying to describe. Um, and so other people think that theories are models, right? And models are something much more abstract. They're not sentences. Uh, they do have some relation to the things in the world. So a model is not the thing in the world, just like a sentence is not the thing in the world that it describes. Uh, but a model has a different sort of relationship with the thing it represents. Um, so what is a, a model? It could be a lot of things. So it can just be a function, right? So force equals mass times acceleration, right? That's a mathematical function um, that sort of exists. Uh, it's not a sentence exactly, right? You can state it in a sentence, um, but it's sort of something else. It may be sort of like a universal. And we did talk about universals uh, in Dretzky's account of laws, right? So it may be some sort of platonic object that's floating out there. Um, there's other kinds of models, right? So here's a, a picture of a model. This is a uh, model in psychology, um, and it's Leslie, and, and it's a model of uh, pretense in children, right? So they, um, it's an account of how it's kind of interesting that children can play and pretend, oh, the banana is a phone, and yet they don't seem to get confused and like try to eat the phone. Um, so it seems to be, it's, it's an interesting um, sort of ability that children have, and, and uh, some psychologists think it's importantly related to some of the abilities that adults have. Um, and so here's a little model of how that works, right? You have perceptual processes that come in, and you have these belief boxes, and you have inferential mechanisms, right? Um, you kind of spit out in behavior at the bottom. So that's a model, right? Uh, what is it? Well, it's sort of a picture, sort of a, a schematic diagram, right? Um, uh, so a picture can be a model, a diagram, a functional diagram can be a model. Lots of things can be models and they're slightly different than sentences. And again, uh, we're not gonna spend too much time on this particular issue, but it's good to note those two different kinds of views that you can have. You can have syntax syntactic view, and then these models are more like semantic views. Um, but they're just different accounts of what, what a scientific theory even is. Okay, so why do I bring up models, right? Um, one important thing to remember is models are idealization. Right? So uh, that picture of the right cycle out the various boxes in your psychology, clearly um, there's no boxes in your head per se, there's a bunch of neurons and the activity of neurons is much more messy, right? Than those boxes make it seem. Um, models are idealizations of actual thing they're they're trying to sort of describe in the world a picture um and even like in physics right newton's laws um when they talk about mass uh what they're actually describing is point masses right so it's just like a an object with no actual physical size right but a mass um real objects are obviously spread out and their mass is distributed in different ways um, but newton's laws simplify it that part of it out right um also, Charles's law, which describes gases, right? Ideal gases. Um, the behavior of an ideal gas is actually not like any gases that um, that are in the real world. Um, so, if we have a model that doesn't actually correspond to the real world, right? It's an idealized version. Um, does that mean that the theory is false? Does that mean that the, the things that it talks about, when Newton talks about mass, he's actually talking about something that doesn't exist in the real world? Um, Maybe, right? We're going to talk about this with a little more detail the rest of the week. Um, and in general, this sort of this this notion about syntactic theories and models just starts to sort of like reveal the idea of like maybe our theories aren't literally true, right? Strictly speaking, um, and I think that should be. I expect this to be sort of surprising or um, unpalatable to anyone who has sort of grown up in our modern world. We really sort of admire science and science is really impressive. We've talked about all the impressive things it can do, um, but it, it's actually kind of difficult to ever say that we think our scientific theories are true, right? Um, and that seems puzzling and unsatisfying and so, the rest of the week, we're going to talk about uh, various attempts either to save that notion and to be able to say, no, look, science is obviously true. It's getting at the truth. Um, or other ways of saying, 
science can still be really impressive and successful without saying it's strictly true fine right it doesn't have to be true it can still be great um okay so that was just a little sort of primer on logical empiricism these general notions of like um our sentences or models of the things we talk about that can't be observed right and yet we still want to understand in some sense how we how those theories of sentences or models could be true even though we can't really um, observe or verify that the things they're talking about are actually there in any straightforward way. Okay, more on this um, shortly.